Ladies and gentlemen, Marks and Marquettes, welcome to the Throne Book Wrestling Podcast. I am your host, Sean Howe, and this week we will be talking, or rather rebooking, Dean Ambrose turning on the shield. But before we do that, there are a couple of things that we need to get out of the way before we get into the main chunk. First of all, get out your bingo cards for the noise in the background sweepstakes, because we're back at it again. This week we've got two types of birds, the the I think the sparrows are above my window, and seagulls, DIY going on in the garden, and sounds from the garage behind the house. That must be a whole line by now. I think the only way I could have chosen a worse place to do this podcast, if it was in the middle, I'll say that again, was if it was in the middle of a main road. I understand why my co-colleague on another podcast I do, called Two in the Bush, insists at recording in his house. Now, which incidentally, he actually made a impromptu appearance into one of the, I think it would have been the latest episode's YouTube comments, just simply saying first, because of course you would. In fact, he actually did that when we were recording an episode of Two in the Bush. And, I mean, it's a bold choice from him, mainly because his YouTube uh, account profile picture still has a I think it's an OC or like representation of him during a phase of his where he was a brony. He hasn't changed that. Which is a bold move. And I respect it. But I realise with just having that on its own under a wrestling podcast may look a bit odd but to each their own that was his choice. I couldn't stop him because I very much tried to. Also, I do just want to uh, talk about a couple of plans that I have with this podcast going forward. Firstly, I think after WrestleMania, I think what I'll do... Well, actually, no, we've got to do the um, how I would have booked it. For, actually, no. Do we? Do we? Because I did the how I would have booked it for Fastlane. But... <sighs> I've already done the how I would have made the map book the matches and a lot of them are similar so we get it. okay that's something I hadn't thought about but after potentially that episode the Wrestlemania how I'd have done it we're gonna do a kind of I suppose to be a four part series sort of kind of they're not really too much different from any other episodes but they're gonna be talking about those NXT call ups not not uh, Black and Ricochet. Oh no, because I came up with this idea long before they were caught up. I'm talking about the on their way to WWE, Heavy Machinery, EC3, Lacey Evans, Nikki Cross. I'm going to book them, rebook them from when they came up to WrestleMania because it's quite a lot of well missed opportunity there because I think all of them respectively in the Battle Royals I think they are. Because EC3 is. Heavy Machinery, I think, are. Yeah, they are. I think. Genuinely, I've, I've lost track of what teams are actually in the SmackDown tag match. They could be in there. I don't think they are. And then I think Nikki Cross and Lacey Evans are probably going to be in the women's battle. Or Lacey Evans probably winning it. So, I feel like you could do more there. And I'm going to try and rebook those partly because as I said I've been meaning to do it for a while and also because it will give some of the um, storylines coming out of Wrestlemania and into the the next year cycle of WWE a bit more time to breathe so then when I eventually get back to them and what they've been doing that will give me a bit more wiggle room I suppose or a lot more mistakes for me to correct because that's almost certainly how it will go secondly I have Despite the fact that I've um, I've said this as well, I will get back and I will eventually do the uh, as live reactions to it on SmackDown. I I had previously, I think I may have brought it up that I've basically been trying to trying to find ways of making sure that I can watch it on SmackDown whilst being a paying, law-abiding citizen, which is very noble, if I may say so myself. But from what I can see, I don't think I can manage that. At the times that I set, I may change the times. I'm not sure. It's still a bit up in the air. Now I will, I will watch them, as I said, but I shall do so with some slightly more underhand tactics, let's say. And that's all I'm going to say on that endeavour, because otherwise, 
and they'll they'll look for you and they'll find you and I'm scared. I don't. <laughs> this is the stupidest little thing I've ever gone on. Because of course not. Anybody probably bought his illegal streaming wise. But anyway, I persisted with that joke, so I went with it. And also, I ha this is probably the idea which is most most on the drawing board, if you will. That isn't quite processing to real life, and that is. I kind of want to do some sort of bonus show, so to speak, or something else to go along with this. Not every week, but a bit less frequent, but something a bit more interesting. And I had the idea, and, I, and I'll straight up say where I got this influ influence from. Because I, um, I like the game of association football quite a lot and listen to several podcasts about that. One of them being on the continent, which is a show about European football. And they have a... Uh, well, one of the hosts there has a kind of side series type thing, which is called At The Match, where he basically goes to big games in Europe and uh, records what like what the atmosphere is like and talks to people while they're there or after the game or what have you and kind of compiles it into a kind of nice little thing of like how this could be summarised and being able to put yourself somewhere where you may not necessarily have the chance to go to. And I was listening to one of these the other day and I just thought, couldn't you do that with a wrestling show? And so from that point, this idea has been wedged right in the back of my head. And there's there's tons of logistics I'm going to have to work out with it. I don't know what I'm going to do. I, could, I don't know whether I'd film it or just record it audio-wise. I don't know whether I could... Like, I need like new microphone stuff. I don't know. Well, I don't, don't know what shows to go to. I don't know how often to do it. The kind of rough thing for that would be maybe once a month because I mean you can't go to too many wrestling shows because otherwise I'll have no money left. I don't have a lot, and doing this too much would mean I'd have not much left at all. So I just I just wanted to get that out there because it's an idea, and it's if it's going to happen, it will probably end up going up maybe by the end of April maybe that well that's if it's going to happen this month I mean I, I don't I don't know whether it could I don't know there might be a really good show in May or something where they might save to so I could go to anywhere I could go to like a big most likely independent promotions because you know I live in the UK but could do something like Ref Pro or Progress which was one of the shows that I said I meant to, meant to watch more of. But I, and also, actually, yeah, it does scratch that itch of wanting to watch more independent wrestling as well. So that's probably one of the reasons why the idea is in my head. Well, I could do some very local shows to me. I know that there is a uh, wrestling company that does occasionally run shows in Hastings. I've never actually been, which I carry on meaning to, because I actually happen to know somebody who is um, training there and is wrestling there. I could reveal who, but I'm not going to, because kayfabe. So I think there's plenty of options there, and I'll let you know any information as soon as I figure out how I'm going to try and do this, basically. So, yeah, yeah, I think that's um, that, those are the plans. Uh, quick talk about uh, Raw and SmackDown. Um, that fight between Ronda, Charlotte, and Becky. I, why did you not just you could you could have you could have that, recorded that seg section. On the first week of the feud, and just aired that, no changes, every single week from Rumble to Mania, and it would have been a better, still would have been a better build to everything else that happened before it, right? And also, I, I, ne I never realised that what I've always wanted to see in wrestling was just like, I'm going to kick you! No, I'm going to kick you harder! <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it's just one of those things. You never know you want it until you see it, and then suddenly it's awesome. I, I want every fight in WWE to turn it out, out like that, or maybe, maybe not necessarily even with your hand, handcuffs. Maybe other limbs could be tied up. So the fight where both both better than having their legs just strained. There's just flailing arms everywhere, just windmilling. That'd be amazing. Just do that. <laughs> and also from SmackDown. The contract signing bit between Kofi and Daniel Bryan was really good. And I think I did inadvertently say a couple of weeks ago um, that I think when after the gauntlet match happened when he lost, 
to Brian at the end that they'd only have one week left for the um, build segment. And I think I did inadvertently say contract signing, so, you know. This, this and Mustafa Ali being in the fast lane match, I'm just... It's almost foresight. <laughs> it's not quite. It's not quite. It's But it's, it's close. And also, I particularly liked um, when you had uh, AJ and Randy again exchanging blows and about uh, vocally and then I'm about to physically and I just I do just like Kevin Owens just skid well not skedaddling because that's if he ran away but he just kind of walked out he just he just knew what was going to happen I, I like that the only way it would have been better is if he was if he just suddenly got on the mic and he just see, says uh, I can see where this is going goodbye everybody and he just walks straight out <laughs> I, I, I like that a lot also actually one negative thing Seeing Asuka in that, what was it, eighteen-person tag mixed tag match? Seeing her there when she had the SmackDown Women's title like last week, it's just, it's just so sad. Just get out while you still can, Asuka. That's all I can say. And uh, that is the WWE painted, patented sigh. That is, I think, I should. I don't know whether I should paint it or they should paint it. They'd probably make more money out of it, but, you know, it's just, I have discussed before, eventually when you go into bad booking for too long, the sigh comes out. It's not anger. It's not despair. It's just deflation. It's, of course. And on that note, let's talk about our storyline, which they really fucked up. Transition. That's really going to wear thin like 10 episodes down the line where the meaning the reason why it's a decord has just gone no one's going to understand it it's just like oh there's a ukulele chord cool so Dean Ambrose where do we start is this the I think I just heard a nice cream truck and now sirens I think there's a police chase going on between when Fiverr and Mr. Whippy. That was... I probably didn't pick up, so I probably cut all of this. But I... Uh, really disrupted me. So, is this the biggest cock-up of a storyline that WWE have made in the last few years? Possibly. I mean, because it had so much promise. Everybody knew that Ambrose was going to turn on the shield eventually because he, he can, you could just kind of tell that he wouldn't... Almost that he wanted the heel run. And then when he got injured, he thought, okay, they're coming back. When's he gonna when you gonna do it? And then suddenly they took what we all saw coming and made it one of the most shocking occurrences to happen on WWE in a good way, I may as well say. In a good way. Shocking and like, oh my god, this is happening now. It's it was cool. And then it looked like Ambrose was going to have this really, really interesting character of somebody who was almost grief-stricken given the whole situation that happened with Roman Reigns in leukemia. And he he's almost doing doing everything he's doing, not almost not maliciously, but just because he doesn't know what else to do. And then within two weeks, he was getting an injection in his ass and going on about germs. What the fuck? What even happened there? I don't... I genuinely... I just... It's so weird looking back at it. Because now we're in a situation where Dean Ambrose is probably going to leave. I say probably because there's still a bit of a... Like, oh, is he really going? Which, I, I mean... I am going to be firmly in the camp that he is until I see him in WWE after the, his contract goes out. But I still feel the need to say probably. But he's. I think he's going. He's got to be. And that's such a shame because he he could have been this big it was a big match at Mania. And he should have been. He has the star power to pull it off. And it just didn't it just didn't work. Because WWE they're, they're well known for, for, for messing up new things. Like everything from NXT. They just don't know what to do with it. But with the people that they've had there for a while, the people they believe in, the people they've pushed, they tend to not or not get it as wrong. Or certainly not as spectacularly wrong. 
But this was, like... I think I may have said previously, this was the first... This storyline, and how wrong it went, was what inspired me to actually make this podcast. Originally, I had had ideas for... Because I've been doing um, Two in the Bush, my other podcast, for a while. And I had had a couple of ideas of what other podcasts I, w- I would want to do. Like, I've wanted to do one about Formula One for a while, and other stuff like that. And the... Uh, fantasy booking thing was just just a tiny little thing that was the that was the way down the line sort of idea but then i saw this and i just i it, it just couldn't leave my brain it's like this is it, it's almost like it was wwe's most incompetent moment that kind of inspired me to actually start coming up with ideas for this i actually i was gonna write like a whole script to it and like make it properly uh, structured which as you probably know if you've listened to other episodes is not the case but, because I think the the Kofi storyline was what made me record myself. But what made that, put that idea, put it in my head and put it as, this is something that we're going to do, was this. Because with this, this should have been the top of the Raw card. Rollins got to the top of the, of the Raw card. Well, he was always going to. But Ambrose should have essentially, almost done bit in a kind of reverse kind of heel way as to what Becky Lynch did in the Smackdown and that well, well, then Raw it's a complicated brand split he should have essentially taken that spot at the top of that card because he could play it he has the, the ability to and he had the presence to and you can tell that I feel passionately about this because I've been rambling on about this by this point. I just need to actually get into what I should think I should do with the booking. Otherwise, it's going to be really, really long. So, I'm going to actually restrain myself from going on about how bad it is. And actually get on with with what they should have done. Actually, given that this whole situation, given that what happened with the storyline and everything else. It does make me feel a bit sad so I feel like a major chord isn't really appropriate so um here we go minor so where do we start well I think we start from the start of this feud where the same night that uh, Reigns had said that I'm going to have to step away from the ring for a while and the shield looked like they were going to win the tap it won the tag titles, everybody was on top of the world, and then Ambrose turned. Now, I remember at the time there was a bit of talk of, oh, should they have done that? Is it, I, some people who were actually quite, quite, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Quite strongly thinking, that wasn't the word I'm looking for, but it's the word I've gone for, were strongly thinking that they shouldn't have, they should have delayed it, but if they had, it would have lost all of its meaning, so we're keeping it. We're keeping that turn. It was great. If there's one thing we're changing, it's one thing. It's one tiny, tiny little thing. And that is that Ambrose doesn't do the dirty deeds, the DDT. I'm going to call it DDT because doing the dirty deeds is just... Oh, dear. But um, doesn't do the DDT onto the exposed concrete. That's a great spot, but I, we're going to save it for later on in the feud, basically. Instead, what Ambrose does is he hits the original the DDT really suddenly on Rollins. Everybody's shocked. And there was this great moment where Ron, uh, Ambrose is shocked himself. And he's kind of he's like surprised at what he did. And he's almost beating himself up about it. And that's good. And what he does, in, the, in my version, is he essentially, he does that. And he kind of almost, he's almost like rolling around, basically. He's like, oh, what, like, what have I done? What have I done? In a sort of actual lunatic sort of way that the lunatic fringe crap nickname by the way would um would do he's just the lunatic from now on because we didn't have he doesn't have a fringe does he anymore maybe that's why he got rid of the fringe just to get rid of the nickname but anyway and he's he's rolling around and essentially he ends up rolling well, I don't sound rolling too much like he's just going but he's he's like in a like Imagine, imagine what Shawn Michaels did when uh, the Undertaker kicked out of the X Mark at WrestleMania 29 when he was the referee. Basically, that. 
but when he's doing that and he rolls out of the ring and he happens to essentially go out on the side of the ring well it's the timekeeper's area and he stops and bef- almost you almost think before he has time to properly think about it he gets up he grabs a chair and starts wailing on Seth with it again and again and again on the back again doing it and he's gonna and he He's always breaking the chair on him, and then again he does the DDT onto the chair in the ring. And that the reason we're doing this is because it's awfully similar to when Seth turned on on the shield, isn't it? Parallels. It's going to be a lot of that, a lot of that sort of subtle storytelling in this because I because I went all out fantasy booking speaking when I was doing this. <laughs> I, I wrote I wrote these notes on the second of December, twenty eighteen, because I had notes for once. But then I did, and there is a whole script or half a script. I didn't actually finish it on my computer, which is still there. Which I'm gonna, I could just use that, but I'm not going to. So from that point, that's where there's some changes start start happening. For for starters, Seth is going to be well, he's going to be distraught at this, and. He, he, the words I've, I've put down here is going to be more determined to help Dean, which I realise when I'm writing it down like that sounds like he, it sounds like I thought that Seth just went eh, okay I'll fight you now because he didn't, but Seth is properly he's because he's in a situation where he's one of his best friends can't do what he loves anymore, or for what he thinks he can do anymore. Obviously he came back, which is great, and his other best friend has just completely pummeled him, and. So I think that Seth, it would almost maybe give him a bit more depth as a character, would want Dean to be, and he said, be nice. Go be nice, Dean. Be nice. But, you know, just kind of, it's like he, he almost doesn't want to accept that Dean is doing what he's doing because of the, the emotional state that Rollins finds himself in. And he, he, he makes those promos and he says, look, Dean, I've known you for a while and I know that you have these tendencies of just kind of, flipping out and doing stuff that you don't mean and i watched i've, I've watched the, what happened last uh last week back over and over and i know you dean and i don't think you meant it and i don't want to take that against you because it's a it's a tough situation for all of us so just p- please just come out here i want to i want to talk to you face to face and Dean doesn't show up. He's nowhere to be seen. He doesn't show up. I mean, I'd say maybe a week, maybe two weeks, depending on. Also, I'm aware at this point that there was the uh, World Cup, I think, the Saudi Arabia thing. I'm not going to put that into my booking. I could look at my script of how I did it, but I'm not going to. Because, well, more out of principle and its effort, but it's... But yeah, so basically, I'd say the exact same thing happens, basically. Where Seth beats... Uh, was it Lashley? Was it Lashley? I think it was Lashley. I'm saying Lashley, like that Lashley. Um, and then loses to Ziggler, which I realise is a bit weird, but you know. That happens. The second change is that we're actually going to... Because you know how the whole this whole angle started with them winning the tag titles? And then the tag titles was essentially just kind of float. Seth kind of had them, didn't do anything with them, and then they lost them to the Office of Pain. Well, he lost them to the Office of Pain because Dean wasn't coming out, which is fine. But we're actually going to keep the tag titles on them for a little bit on them for a little bit longer. Not too much longer, obviously, because they're not a team anymore. They hate each other. But well, they don't hate each other. Well, Dean hate. You, you know what I mean. Because you, this way you can actually use these as an actual storyline thing. It's something that's actually, that, that Seth realises, is how we can bring them together. And it's how it's going to um, contribute into some matches that they find themselves in, right? So, basically, I think at this point we have Baron Corbin as GM on Raw. And remember that? Oh dear. But Baron Corbin, because he isn't completely incompetent says I need to get 
these tag titles off of you two because you're not a team. We need to have them on a team because we need to keep Raw as a decent-ish show. You know. But but you just but didn't, didn't you just put a a main title on a on somebody who doesn't, barely shows up to the to the show? Shut up. Um, basically, every week leading up to Survivor Series, because remember there wasn't very many. I think there was only two. Yeah, I think it was only two. Corbin puts Seth because he's got both belts. And it's, it's quite, it was quite a cool visual having him with the IC belt and both tag belts. And he says, "Well, I need." I, I need those ta- tag belts on my tag team, so I'm going to put. You're going to have to defend those titles by yourself. And basically, what we're going to do is, it's going to start off with the Office of Pain coming out because again, it makes most sense for him for Corbin to put the Office of Pain out there to win the belts off them. But the match goes a little bit differently because what happens is Office of Pain are pretty much dominating. Seth has a couple of hope spots, as kind of happened in the match, but he's really struggling to get up and. Uh, Drake Maverick on the outside is be all smug and like, yeah, we're going to be the champions. <laughs> this is great. Only got the feet one person. And then, suddenly, whack. Maverick goes down. He's been hit on the back with a steel chair. And, oh my god, that's Ambrose. We haven't seen him for a couple of weeks. I just remember that was actually part of the booking. I didn't actually mention that earlier, but you hadn't, you hadn't seen him up until this point. And the Office of Pain are completely completely surprised by this. They're like, what the fuck are you doing, mate? You make no sense. Well, actually, for a second, can see there's only one of them in the ring. And then Rollins, who is down, but who, who, no, who was down, rather, hadn't seen what's happened, rolls, rolls him up, one, two, three... Rollins wins. He goes to celebrate, and then he sees Dean there. And he just freezes, and he's like, "Did you, did you do what I thought you think you did?" And the ref hasn't gone over to get the titles because he can. Because he's again, he's trying to. Well, he's thinking that there's probably about to be a big old fight going on, and Ambrose kind of walks around, slightly erratically, maybe goes didn't speed or whatever because you know he's a bit mad and he walks around the ring and you think he's going to come back in and he goes halfway around because he would have been out of the ramp and he just grabs both the tag titles and skedaddles out of there I can't say skedaddle it's a, it's a fun word but that implies running away he isn't he's just he just takes both belts and he goes oh right okay so then uh, we've got we have next week Seth, who by the way is also going to be in the champion versus champion match against Shinsuke Nakamura, the US champion, and so he he's already got a match at Survivor Series. He has he's now having to face the revival because I mean technically you could have the Office of Pain face him again. It'd be very WWE to do that, but let's just say that Maverick got injured, so they're with their guy, and but this time. Rollins comes out and he has no idea whether Dean's going to be there and it's like people don't really know what's going on because the belts aren't there so it's like is it is, are they going to become tag champions impromptu but then suddenly the ref's about to say well okay I've been told it's a title match I'm supposed to have to ring the bell come down the crowd here comes Dean Ambrose and everybody's surprised and but he he kind of he gets over the barrier but he doesn't go up to the tag rope he kind of he kind of stand kind of stands there and just watches, and Seth's trying to say, "Are you going to come up here? Are you going to give me a hand?" And then before he, anything happens, the revival from behind attack them because what heals not the heals, and they're basically working Seth over because they are a very good tag team. And Amber is just kind of watching on, and he's not. He's I'd say he's maybe he's still holding both belts. And then it gets to the point where basically Revival been dominating the whole match. Rollins is in quite a bad way. They throw him into the corner to kind of try and bounce him back. No, no, not to the corner. Into the ropes for the Shatter Machine. But Ambrose suddenly jumps up, tags, and Revival just kind of 
they realise, oh, hang on, he's just tagged in. And they, they don't really know what to do. Rollins just kind of essentially just flops back forwards because he's not being shatter machined anymore. And Ambrose is being being the kind of unstable man that he is, just goes after him and like, man- manages to kind of almost c- clear the ring of both of them, maybe suicide dive, and you're thinking, oh, is Ambrose being a baby face again? And then it goes on for another couple of minutes. Ambrose is, he's just, he's starting to feel realise, oh God, there's two very skilled men that I'm trying to take on. And he's just starting to... Uh, well, he basically, he's been rival taking back con- uh, con- kind of control over him. It, well, he's outside. He rolls, rolls him into the ring. Rollins is just managed to get up. He grabs the ankle of Dash. Let's say he would be, be the legal man in this situation. That distracts him for long enough. Ambrose hits the uh, DDT. Rollins, meanwhile, is uh, taking care of uh, Dawson on the outside. One, two, three. Ambrose and Rollins are, go- are going. The Survivor Series to face the SmackDown Tag Team Champions. We and suddenly it's like you see maybe Corbin's watching on. He's like, oh, uh, uh, and it, he's kind of like he's thinking, shit, they're going to kill each other and they're tag team champions. We're going to lose because guess what? Raw aren't winning every single match apart from the weird tag match team one when they didn't because pre-show isn't continuity. I guess we're not having that. But and also one other change that we're making is that instead of the bar beating the New Day for the tag titles at I think it was SmackDown 1000, the Usos do. I think you may be able to see where this is going. We've got Ambrose and Rollins against the Usos, and the Usos provide well, a they provide a very good match on SmackDown 1000 because damn it, the New Day versus Usos are just really good matches. But also. They, given the relation that they all have to Reigns, it sort of basically throughout this time, throughout the time that Ambrose has been kind of playing that sort of tag game, he's he's he hasn't. Let's say he hasn't really been thinking properly, so to speak. I mean, he probably has been, but the story. I'm saying this for sake of simplicity. He hasn't really been thinking about that. That's been at the back of his mind. The fact that he he had previously basically been grieving for Reigns's. Reigns, despite because I mean he hadn't died, obviously it'd be, it was a very serious situation. But going into the going into the ring with the Usos, it's just gonna it's gonna flare it back up. That memory is gonna come back. And Ambrose, this is gonna be what takes Ambrose over the edge. And they have a have a good they probably have a very good match. I, from memory, I did think of spots, but I can't think of what they were. I think there was gonna be. Actually, no. I remember what it was. I remember what it was. It... One of the Usos hits Rollins with a super kick, and Ambrose is kind of fighting, uh, fighting the other Uso outside, and he manages to fight him. And then uh, the Uso does the, does the uh, splash, and he does the little kind of fist cock thing that he did in, in tribute. It was always very, it was always nice when the Usos did that. But instead, we're actually going to use that for a storyline reason. Ambrose, who you can kind of see in other parts during the match, was kind of starting getting a bit... It he, he, he did almost feel like he didn't really want to fight them, because, again, because of the relation with Reigns. He sees that, and he could run in and break up the pin, but he doesn't. He just watches it happen, and he gets into the ring. And Rollins, remember, he's going to have another match, and for sake of simplicity, we'll have him have another match. After this one, they, they are back to back, and Ambrose suddenly it all clicks together in his head, and he goes after him again. And, he, and he's pumped because there hadn't really been any in this in the angle previous in the way that I'd done it. There hadn't been any major kind of like, like ground and pound like punching and stuff like that, which feels like a, it could be used as a bit more of a personal way of of um, of hit of hurting Seth as opposed to just doing the DDT. I mean, yes, he hit him with a chair, but it's a lot more sort of what well, you've got to, you're doing it, you're seeing it happen and all that, and you're not thinking about that. You can tell that Ambrose is, it's all in his head and he's like, right, I know what I'm doing now. I'm going to kill, I'm going to kill you now because it, it, it makes sense to me. But of course it doesn't make sense because he's mad, but you know. And this is where we do the, um, the uh, DDT onto the exposed concrete because I think that'd be good. 
because suddenly because that again that makes it feel like a lot more of a um, devastating move and Seth is rolled back into the ring he's just taken a quite a hefty blow to the head who's the one person that you don't want to be be in the ring with when you've just taken a hefty blow to the head how about Shinsuke Nakamura I could have gone for a joke there saying Nia Jax in fact that was a missed opportunity someone's talking in the background that's probably two lines by now we had an ice cream van earlier I probably cut that, but I'm not going to keep this in. <laughs> anyway, so basically Nakamura is smug as all hell, and he's like, he sees Rollins, who's basically just a crumpled mess on the floor. He's like, okay. Knee to the head. One, two, three. And then from this point on, actually, I might as well point, point out, Ambrose hasn't spoken. He had a, quite a bit of that when he was still in the shield when he came back. He wasn't really speaking much. But he hasn't spoken at all by this point. And what we start to put in with this angle is the use of Renee Young on commentary. Because from memory, when she they're talking about it a lot, about Ambrose's antics last time, you, she basically just said, nah, nah. But if we're going to use the fact that Renee and Ambrose are married then we've got to use it for a storyline reason. And essentially, when they ask, well, f- firstly, you kind of say, well, I don't know. I've, I've tried to talk to Dean about this, but he's, he's just he just stays completely silent. Whenever I try and, try and talk to him about it, he just doesn't say anything. He's just And as the storyline goes on, because it will, these questions carry on ha- happening more and more, and you can tell Renee is getting more and more frustrated. You could, he's kind of implied that Ambrose isn't really. He's kind of he's kind of descending in on himself in a way. He's not really giving that much care or anything to any, anybody around him, and he's kind of fully kind of just going into his own head, and it's kind of it's affecting Renee in that way. And, and she carries on getting asked these questions about it when she goes to work. So it's like eventually it will get to the point where Renee, despite the fact that she's a a, a baby faced commentator. Would essentially would start to grow this kind of resentment towards Seth. This would this wouldn't be happening right where we are in the storyline. This would be happening further down. But I'm saying it while I remember it, to say it. But basically, by the time that uh, the WrestleMania bill is happening, because it's building to WrestleMania, by the way, that Renee just is something really resents Ron because she, can, she is like whatever has happened to Dean Rollins. Was been the through point. He's he has been what's co- in her mind. He has been what's caused Dean to become um, so different to the person that she that she married, basically. So it's a kind of way of putting a sort of like somebody, somebody in Dean's corner because the stuff that he he did it was the sort of thing where even the sort of heel move where even Corey Graves would say, "Oh, I think this is a bit too far." And I think what you can do here is maybe you can have Corey, despite being the heel. Start, he sides with Seth because he see, he's see he been seeing what's going on and he still has some sort of moral compass. Whereas Renee, who does have a moral com- compass, but just because of the, all of the situations going on with her, just almost can't see it. And he's just rooting for her husband, not not out of any nepotism type way, or I don't know if that's the right word, but or kind of in a partner type way, but just to say, just to, like once, if Seth is beaten, if Dean beats Seth, then, it, then hopefully, then it, all of the things that she'd have had to have gone through would have been over, right? Okay, so I, that was again, as I said, that was just saying that while I remember it. When we go to where we actually are, which is on in the build to TLC. Seth has taken quite a hell of a beating at Survivor Series, but he's just about going to be ready because he's still maybe he could maybe take it back. Stuff like a concussion. I realise that's a bit of a dodgy subject. With these sort of things, but maybe say something like that, or imply it at the very least, and say, but he's going to be ready for TLC, and he will face Dean Ambrose for the Intercontinental Championship. And Dean essentially comes out for the first week. He comes out, and he basically, I'd say he comes out to the crowd, hopefully you're booing, and just walks straight back out again. Because again, he isn't talking. He isn't talking, he's just, perhaps, perhaps there's a situation where he's got to sign a contract, Maybe Seth has signed it from home and he's got to sign it and you expect it to be a promo, but it's just nothing. 
have something like that and essentially we use because you don't necessarily need to build this much too much you can do kind of video packages for this because but also you might think hang on i thought you were saying you're going to wrestlemania you could be you can be getting rid of this far too far too soon uh, no 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 you just wait perhaps you can have Rollins coming back like week before for a promo like go home show in fact you probably would do that but basically it, it's not necessary let's say and so we get to tlc and in an interesting move seth rollins comes out first now i know i know i think i've, I've actually used this as a booking crutch before i must have got it from this where you think but you think like, oh, the champion shouldn't come out first. The challenger should be come out first. Tradition. But again, there's story no reason for this because Seth really wants to get his hands on Dean by now because he's just because now he's like, okay, I tried, I tried to get some sense out of you. I put if you all of the, the compassion that I have, and then you did that at Survivor Series. Nah, mate, I am gonna kill you now. I don't know why it's a lot of killing thing. Like you, I, I don't know why I'm carrying on saying that in these bits. But anyway, so Rollins is so keen. He says, and he basically says, right, right, Dean, come out, come in now. I am going to shove my boot down down your throat. And so far, that I'm going to be able to kick what you had for dinner last night, something like that. And guess what? Dean Ambrose doesn't show. And Seth, you can see, is really annoyed at this. And then eventually, so let's say they start doing like a count out thing, and he says, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. If Dean is too scared to show up, I'm not going to leave here and not give these people a, a defence of the IC title. So, how, do, how about... We do good old fashioned open challenge. So, anybody out in the back, come and get it. Now's your chance. So, Seth says the uh, challenge, and out comes Alistair Black. Yeah, you can tell this is getting really big fantasy booking, can't you? Couldn't do an NXT call up, but couldn't do go well. I actually briefly had a moment where I think the first idea I had for using the ukulele. For um, in entrance themes going to be there. I did actually have a moment. It's been edited out, but I thought, do could I play House of Black's theme song on there? And I thought, I could. Do I remember it? No. I think I did learn how to play it because I was trying to think about how to do this episode. But I'm not going to do that completely off the bat because that would just be really bad. So anyway, Black comes out and hopefully the crowd are going wild. They're like, oh my god, this is going to be a really good match. Doing these suits, I mean, we haven't seen before, and lo and behold, they probably put on a very good match. Again, I don't want to talk. Too, I don't want to talk too much about it because they know more about wrestling than I do. I just, whenever I talk about these things, I just kind of lay out spots that should happen. A bit like an agent, I suppose. But you know, but they put on. A, I mean, I I would quite like uh, something to do with like I don't know, like flipping out the Falcon Arrow suplex combination or something. Or maybe, oh, actually, hang on, why didn't you? <laughs> Seth goes for the superplex and he manages to basically flip out of it, lands on his feet, does the whole sit down thing. That'd be quite cool. But anyway, that's not what's important. What's important is the finish because it'd probably be a very, very even match because, you know, you've got to give the NXT call up the rub. And, but it just starts to look like Seth's going to win when suddenly... You hear like this disturbance in the crowd. There are no cameras on it originally, but you just kind of, kind of see it, and then it cuts to the to a camera guy who would be filming the ring from the entrance, and he kind of turns around because he's noticed this disturbance, and you see there's this man in a hoodie, and he's kind of jumped over the barriers, and he's dragging another fan over, who notably is wearing a Seth Rollins T-shirt. He's a blonde. She's a stunt granny, etc. Of course, guy in the hood is Dean Ambrose, and so Rollins is fuming at this because I mean, if I was in that situation, I would be. Meanwhile, Alistair Black has got up, and he thinks to himself, "No man is ever truly good. No man is ever tr truly evil. I've done things you never could, and we will never be equal." Black masks to Seth Rollins from behind, 
was anti kind of anti hero ish. One, two, three. Alistair the Black is the new Intercontinental Champion. He he um, he basically he grabs the title and he just to kind of save face, he kind of looks down at Seth Rollins and says it says something something vaguely uh gothish. Like uh some you know, something Alice the Black would say was like, like I'm sorry, Seth. You have I you have no sins to be paid or something like that. That was a joke that I thought of when Black was in the middle of the feud with Gargano and doing stuff like that. So, um, <laughs> anyway. And then, again, Ambrose is just, just goes out and he unloads on him. You know, it's the same sort of thing. And it's, it almost feels like a bit like a cycle. And But this time, Ambrose is going to injure him again. But this time, he goes to the side of the ring. There's a, there's a little box. Something co- it's basically it's a box covering something. He removes it. It's... A bunch of cinder blocks. Yeah. Do you remember? And he drags Rollins over to it. DDT. Onto the cinder blocks. Oh boy. That looked like it hurt quite a lot. I imagine those would be the exact words of Michael Cole. (laughs) And Ambrose walks away. And again, he isn't showing up very much. But he's done what he needs to do. So you think. Get to that. The meantime, in TLC, there's a couple of things I need to address for this storyline to fully work. Now, it was at this point, I think it was TLC, or at least I hope it was, where you had Corbin, who she said, if you, Str- Braun, Brawny Strowman, if you beat me, then you will be, you you get your title match against Brock Lesnar at Royal Rumble. Ah, that's exactly how Baron Corbin talks. But we're just going to make a couple of, couple of alterations to that I think and what we're going to do is because again Corbin is the evil man- gen- uh, general manager but it's just make a couple of moves just make a bit more sense also on this pay-per-view we will have Drew McIntyre facing Finn Balor and Corbin can say whoever wins this match will get a number one contendership shot at the universal title at Royal Rumble because he's going to add more people to that match to make it more difficult for Braun Strowman because of course he is because he's also scared of Braun Strowman Braun Strowman. That match goes to a no contest, the uh, Balor McIntyre one. So they're so basically they're both going to be in the Universal Title match at Royal Rumble, and Strowman pretty much has what happened in real life. Apart from Balor wouldn't be involved in the group of baby faces that helped him, Strowman would beat Baron, and he would get that main that uh, Mania match, the uh, Rumble match. So we're going into the build to the Royal Rumble. And it's a fatal four-way for the Universal title. And Rollins, by the way, at this point is uh, he again? He's he's injured, so he's off TV for a couple of bit, couple of couple of weeks. But uh, at some point, uh, Black can come out. I'd say maybe give him a sort of again sort of open challenge type deal where he can beat kind of on the carders and show show off how good of a competitor he is. And he can say, like Seth. I nearly did a Dutch accent now, I'm not going to. Seth, how I, I, I don't feel right about how I beat you, basically. So, it was an unfortunate circumstance. So, whenever you're ready to come back, I, I challenge you for this IC, ti- IC title rematch. See if you can win your title back. Meanwhile, we've got some sort of build talking of, going on about the Fatal 4-Way match, the Universal Ch- Championship. Except, suddenly... Let's say you've got all three men are in the ring. They're saying, oh, I think I'd be the champion. No, I think I'll be the champion. No, I think I'll be the champion. Guess which one was Braun Strowman there? It was the first one. <laughs> and then Paul Heyman comes out and he does his usual thing. He's like, hey, you guys are great. You guys are really good. But none of you are as good as Brock Lesnar. And he's notably... Heyman is doing this from the top of the ramp, all these three guys in the ring. And then suddenly, they get this, I realise this is a bit of a bit of a trend in this booking, but it, also this episode is going long. But anyway, whack from behind with a steel chair, it's Dean Ambrose. The hell is he doing? What, what, why? Why are you doing this, Dean? You make no sense. You make no sense. So uh, with that programme, eventually we get to a point where uh, Brock is can be bothered to turn up. But Brock, he's in a he's in a mood 
Well, he doesn't really care about any of the three other guys in the ring. He Obviously, they're going to be fighting for his title. But he cares about the fact that his manager just got completely whacked completely laid out by somebody who isn't even in the match so when he comes in he's looking for Ambrose he's only looking for Ambrose and actually let's say it's a contract signing and but Lesnar comes out and he let's say beginning the show and he's he's pissed off and he's basically just looking for Ambrose and then it's contract signing for the final segment and you've got all three guys and, and Brock there and Brock is Kind of on edge, I'd say, because he, you know, he hasn't quite managed to get his hands on Dean Ambrose. He he wants to get that out of the way before he has the fight for the Universal Championship, and then naturally the um, as contract signings tend to do, it breaks down into a fight, and they've all signed the contract, and then Dean Ambrose comes out, hits Finn Balor from behind with a chair. Yeah, uh, Brock, let's say Brock has been put for a table by Braun Strowman. Power slam, etc. He sees this and he tries to get up, and Dean notices that conveniently left in the middle of the ring, there's that contract, and there's a little pen there. Signs his own name on it, throws it down, gets out of there. Suddenly, Dean Ambrose has managed to insert himself into this match, and the um, wait, would it, hang on, were there GMs at this point? I don't think there was. Admittedly, I didn't see that when I first booked it. But let's just say, Triple H, for example, he comes out and he says, I mean, we've got a bit of a problem here because this is a legally binding document. This is this is the document that we send out to our investors, that we send out to the venue, to everyone else, to, to say what the match is. And now it's got Dean Ambrose's name on it. I think he has to be in the match. I don't think there's anything we can do. So that match is going to happen at Rumble. And then, just let's say a week or so before, maybe two weeks before, Rollins comes back and he has that rematch with Alistair Black. Again, it's a very even match, but Black picks up the win, fair and square. And Rollins is kind of left in the middle of the ring. And you can tell that he he's abject at this point because he's had no luck at all. And this is what you have to do sometimes with storylines. You have to, have to take someone down to build them back up again. And Seth says... Something along the lines of, this has been the worst four, three or four months of my life. Nothing has gone right. And there have been times where I've been wondering whether I should carry on. But damn it, I am nothing but not persistent. And I am going to prove myself to myself. Because I know that when the day is right and when I can get all of this shit out of my head that I can be Monday Night Rollins once again. So I am going to be in the Royal Rumble and I'm going to win the whole fucking thing. Basically. Probably a bit less swearing. Probably. I mean, given what he was like in the actual fast lane this year, maybe not. But, you know. And basically, you can kind of see where this is going. Rollins wins the Rumble and in the Universal title match, uh... I, I came up with this idea for the spots, basically. You've got... Uh, Strowman is caught in the Camille lock by uh, Brock on the injured elbow that he had. He's in a lot of pain. And then, because then they're busy, Balor manages to do a coup de grace onto both of them, because they'd be quite by the corner, and he kind of has to... He, he hits it and kind of rolls around, and he thinks, oh, Balor's going to win, and then suddenly Ambrose catches him. DDT, one, two, three, pins Balor. Dean Ambrose is the Universal Champion. So that's how we get to the, the build up to Mania. And, well, basically, the, the idea that I have for this is that it's going to be basically standard sort of blood feud stuff. You have pull apart brawls, have stuff like this. It's The final thing can be a promo segment, put my way in it. You know, do whatever you like. And Ambrose basically says the only reason that I am holding this title is because I know. That this is everything that you want, Seth. All that you've ever wanted to be. You've never wanted to be a friend. You've never wanted to be a brother. All you've wanted to be is the one man at the top. Because you're selfish. And you've never... You're you're a psychopath. You've never loved anyone you claim to have in your life. And all you want is this. So as long 
as you want this, you are never going to have it. As long as I am here in the WWE, you will never be Monday Night Rollins, etc. And I've also got to just build something in here, which I've, which I mean, obviously is great, which is Roman Reigns coming back. In this storyline, he's obviously we're not going to have that Shield reunion because it just wouldn't make sense storyline wise. But what we will have instead of as a um, maybe not main event at Fastlane, maybe main event depending on is Roman Reigns' return match. And let's say he's facing Baron Corbin. Because why not? He's somebody who can lose. And let's say you've got you got a Baron Corbin's weird mates. They try they try and interfere, but Rollins comes out. Oh, he he helps fight him off. Reigns hits spear. One, two, three. Roman Reigns has come back in his return match and it's all great. And him and Rollins are celebrating. And then Ambrose kind of comes out. No music. And he's just kind of looking at him. He's holding the belt. He's looking at them both. And you can te- you can tell he is... Because given that the whole thing started with him essentially grieving over, over Reigns' leukaemia, he can see him. He's back in the ring. And he sees them. And he's not, like, being intimidating. He's not going, oh, I'm the champion, etc. He's looking at them. And he's you can see there's almost a bit of panic in his eyes. And he's thinking, have I done the right thing? You can kind of see he's like uh, Rollins is kind of basically just Reigns is and he's just like a bit kind of he doesn't really know what to do with himself and Rollins kind of kind of looking on like in sort of kind of classic sort of stare down type way and I think what Reigns should do in this feud is he how about he kind of says because it's, it's tricky to book him in something here because with this storyline going on so. In this situation, I wouldn't actually have Reigns have a match at WrestleMania, which is, I, I realise that's probably not a great business idea. But basically, Reigns can just say, hey, like, the people saying, oh, who wants to go to WrestleMania? And there's probably a lot of people out there who'd probably want to face me at Mania. But ultimately, as, as shit, shit as my position has been, I haven't been in the company for the last couple of months. There are people here who have built themselves up who deserve to have matches, and I will happily just sit. I will. I will. I don't need a match, and I will. But I'll be supporting my supporting my man Seth the whole way. Something like that. So he's basically in his corner. May not necessarily come out with him, but he's saying he's kind of metaphorically. He's like, I'm going to be rooting for you, Seth. So finally, we get to WrestleMania, and we have that big match between. Rollins and Ambrose, and I think that if you actually gave them this sort of this stage, that's the word I'm looking for, and in and that they'd be in um, a place, is it, well, uh, uh, character-wise, that both would fit them quite well, because they they put on very good matches. People kind of forget that people because I remember the TLC match was not much, not anything special, but if you put gave them this, and I think I think they'd be able to put on a very very good match and I know and then so hopefully they do and obviously the match is going to end with Ambrose getting curb stomped one two three Seth Rollins is finally universal champion he's celebrating in the ring Roman comes out to celebrate with him and he offers a hand to Dean and Dean looks at him and you can tell that he's like he almost doesn't really know what to do but he just sucked finally he just listens to common sense takes the hand reigns pulls him up finally the shield are united again at this situation and then from this point ambrose could leave if he still wants to i would say maybe if you want to have one other shield he put for sake of simplicity we'll say that he still want to leave i'm not going to have some sort of assumption saying that, that this storyline would make him stay i mean it people could argue that I'm not going to because ultimately I think Ambrose said he doesn't hokey stuff and there's no hokey gas mask stuff here but again I'm not going to assume that maybe you can have him if he doesn't want to leave maybe you can just have a situation where they as as a unit put over a big faction coming in maybe Undisputed Era maybe British Strong Style depending on and then, but from that point, hopefully, 
everybody's happy because you've got the titles on the right guy. You had a great heel run for somebody who really deserves it, and you don't waste all of the potential that it had. Hopefully, and on that, uh, on that, oh, it's not really a hope because it didn't happen that way. But on that, hopefully, nice little end. That does bring us to the end of the podcast. So thank you very, very much for listening. If you enjoyed it, then then do subscribe and what happen you have whatever you happen to be watching slash listening on, whether that be YouTube, uh, Stitcher, iTunes, Acast, whatever it may be. Uh, give us a review on the those one, one on the podcast providers or comment down below in YouTube. Uh, if you want to contact us, you can um, get us on Twitter. It's at throwingbookpod or you can call, email us at throwingbookpodcast at gmail.com. I've mentioned it a couple of times this podcast, but if you want to catch me in another podcast, you can you can find me and my good pal Timothy Broad on Two in the Bush. You can search that into into iTunes, uh, SoundCloud, and Stitcher, and Acos, whatever else. Um, I think that might be everything. This has been the longest episode so far, so I don't really need to waffle on anymore. If I've forgotten anything, then apologies. But I wish you all a, a very happy WrestleMania weekend. I hope that all the shows deliver. I hope I can stay up for that long. And I hope you can stay up for that long as well. And I will bid you farewell.